right, here we are at, I guess, uh, 12.45 on, uh, on Wellington's Victory. Uh, we're seeing a large-scale assault by the French, mainly all breaking down into skirmishers. Do, does not feel realistic to me, uh, the way the skirmishers are being used, but... This may be like the asymmetrical uh, sequence of play, a situation where these rules for the game are not really intended um, for uh, most <laughs> Napoleonic battles, and it's really kind of a workaround being able to break, uh, you know, your guards into a bunch of skirmishers, essentially, in order to fight, uh, you know, to, to create some kind of fight for the Huguenot. Uh, see the French extending away from the Huguenot fight toward La Haison, and uh, considering moving commands up to try to take uh, some of the other space in between, um, in between the, uh, the ridge lines. <coughs> And meanwhile, the Allies are also moving forces up to try uh, to extend their own defenses. We have forces over here coming into play, forces over here coming into play, as the battle is just developing around the Hugmo. Um, I've had to tinker around with the rules. <sighs> A little bit at least, where uh, unprotected guns with no crew or anything, uh, which has been the most recent thing that got kind of into, into my way. I, what it may be is that that had to be handled via the shock rolls. It just, it feels like I'm being blocked by guns uh, in movement that I would have wanted to make. So, and if those are actually captured, destroying guns actually does cause a morale loss. So. I think I'll follow that instead of uh, keeping them kicking around the way I've got them and actually score some losses there. One little weirdness I found in the victory conditions for Battle of Waterloo, enemy artillery batteries. At the end of the game, an artillery battery is considered captured if it's stacked in the same hex as an enemy troop strength point or if no friendly troop strengths were on it. So clearly I could walk into that somehow. I wouldn't shock it to destroy it. And that wouldn't happen anyway. It'd shot, like, I'm getting confused because Nay versus Wellington has very similar rules, but artillery just disappear when they run out of ammo or whatever. Um, but I really do feel like I should be able to get things off the map rather than have them stacked with me and everything. Could this have some effect in the game? Yeah, sure. Um, but it does not count towards my, my initial... Uh, morale points. I don't remember anything that said I could walk into artillery's hexes, though, until I hit this roll, right? <laughs> and that's the problem. And I don't remember shock combat having anything special about it. So, you know, with regard to if you shock artillery, if you get a result, it's just getting rid of it's getting rid of the gun crew, I think. Which means... I don't know what would allow me... Like, I'm not allowed to march into where enemy units are. Right? <laughs> I don't know. Maybe, maybe it's only infantry or something. I, I have no idea. I'm going to just keep this here as a... Uh, and, and maybe I'll create a pile of these things as destroyed artillery, the chances of it being recovered are so low. I'm not going to do that with this one because I haven't swept over it yet, you know. Uh, I think that gun could be remanned. Certainly a skirmisher could go take it and, and start firing. A uh, rainy, rainy day here. Yeah, it's Wednesday. Um, and it's going to be for a while. Yeah. It's hard to stay awake on rainy days, but then I think it's hard to stay awake during sunny days, too. I just, I feel this desire to snooze and curl up on my beanbag. I could be playing great. 
Uh, there's stuff I need to do, but on the other hand, I'm not, you know, I'm trying to, I don't know, <laughs> whatever. Uh, I decided not to, for whatever reason, to put it off until nighttime. And instead, I kind of have to force myself up here to do anything. Anyway, we're on the command phase here at whatever I said, 11.45, something like that, right? Oh, I can't keep track of time. 12.45. Um, and, yep, French command phase means I get to decide, well, I don't think I got any charges set up yet. We're getting some cav up near the front. It's just, it's not aimed the right way to do anything. And, uh, uh, we're also going to have to deal with uh, commanders, you know, whether we want to br bring any more new units into play. I think almost definitely we're going to start over here, but... <laughs> yeah, I decided not only to bring uh, this brigade in, bring some Calvin as well to swoop in. Uh, give me a little protection there. I don't really need it in quite the same way, but I might as well take advantage of it, right? But that's got me up to 14 units committed. Of course, the Allies have 12, so, you know, we're, we're seeing the whole battlefield get committed. <sighs> the way the command system works here is kind of funky. Um, the fact that, like, Okay, it's not clear how I get these intermediate commanders. The way that I'm putting them on is creating this weird sort of situation where, you know, Ney has to come by and say, look, I want you guys to support this. But then that creates the divisional commander. And the divisional commander can, like, decide whatever the hell he wants to do with the rest of his units to support some other choice. And similarly, the... Uh, first Corps commander is going to be able to make whatever decisions he wants to make about the First Corps. Or divisional commanders could, but uh, those don't tend to come in, right? But you're working your way up, and a as you get individual units, you get, uh, you know, the, 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 y y you work your way up the, the, ra the range, you always get an intermediate commander in play, who can run around and command more units and throw them into fights that are not really, you know, what the rest of his unit has been committed to. <laughs> very, very different from the orders-based systems. I like it less. Uh, we're on rallies. And I couldn't find much that I can rally. These guys are close in. There was somebody up here who got rallied. But the skirmisher is still running, running, running. They got a long way to come back. Growing up, they do not need one, two, three, four, five, six. They do not need a commander. One, two, three, four, five, six. Uh, they just need to be outside of maximum range. Let's rally them all the way up. It's okay that Kellerman's running over here. He needs to get there. But. Yeah, I forgot. Skirmishers rally relatively easily. Oops. <laughs> okay. Uh, that's going to put me on the Allied movement, including facing formation. See what they can do. As they start moving the Allies, found uh, an Allied skirmisher that should have recovered last turn and moved it back into position as well. I think. <laughs> also found um, a unit that was disordered that would have gotten recovered, you know, way back, but just from moving over a hedgerow or something like that, you know, <laughs> that it got messed up. And way back, you know, it would have recovered as well. But more importantly, I found a mystery or the solution to a mystery. I had a couple of these uh, decent British. Uh, gun crews and now I found the guns that they go with one of them here is Bull who's one of the specials the other one is Smith who is not 
pretty sure he's not. I don't know what the... Uh, what is the... I think it's this. Is the uh, rocket unit. Really should have something to... I, it, it should have a different symbol on it because it can't be used like artillery. It's just piece of garbage, really. Um, really high quality troops with, with garbage artillery. Uh, but yeah, I have been wondering why I had a couple extra gun crews for the Brits and, you know, really high quality ones. Well, I found the missing, the pieces that needed them. Kind of an annoying point, moving these over, I shifted uh, second core units to get closer to Hugmont. They have some high quality units I want to have there. I want the cav on the flank more. I figure I've got these crappy Dutch units coming into play. I should be near the Hugmont with things that can collapse into skirmishers just in case I need to defend it. Which I, you know, attrition, it's going to be an attrition battle that, there, essentially. The skirmisher versus skirmisher works out that way. I don't see a way for the French to take it. I just don't. <laughs> They don't have as many, uh, as many skirmishers <laughs> available, at least not right there. And what the Imperial Guard can't be converted into them, which makes the idea like the first and second guard, which makes the idea of the guard being able to like take the Hugomont an impossibility. I think, <laughs> of course. They wouldn't have an effect either if they failed because they'd all be skirmishers if they could. So I don't know. <laughs> um, but uh, I came to a point where I'm out of tea. And yeah, I've. It, it's not a huge thing to move the rest of the British units, but I need to break. So I'm putting my tweezers in the way to show that and everything. Going into more detail about like the meta shit, like yeah, I got to mark where I am while I get myself ready to finish this little segment of the turn that I'm doing. Right, extending the defenses to this uh, La Hasson uh, skirmisher line. I've had to unleash some skirmishers to protect me from the artillery there. Um, since I'm on the defensive, I have a much less difficult time. Like, I could have done, gone for a counter-offensive type move here. I thought about it. It would mean moving a skirmisher forward, getting like a one in six chance of it surviving artillery fire. Now, it would start using up artillery ammo, <laughs> but I don't have an infinite supply of skirmishers. In fact, far from it. And... Uh, so I just want to screen my line as I put it into place uh, to defend and, you know, that way if the French get through that skirmisher line, then they have to face linear forces that can give them some firepower. Uh, luckily, one of my units, hey, it detached a skirmisher. Oh, shit. No, it's in column because, yeah, <laughs> because it cannot be in linear formation because it's a four strength point unit. It's too big. Uh, it, would ex it would turn into extended line if it did. Um, yeah, I, the, the allied line formation is really awful in this, in this system. You really don't want to deal with it. The French line, uh, like anything linear, is a pain in the ass because it might have to go to extended line. The units are too big to cover the hexes. Uh, what does that mean? You know, like it wouldn't be a big deal if the hexes were if the hexes were uh, covering a larger amount of territory. So you change the scale a little bit, and you wouldn't have this uncomfortable mechanism in play at all. You would have what you have in like uh, Viva la Empa. You know, <laughs> right? Yes, you have extended lines there, but you use them to extend your line to cover more territory, not because you're forced to. Right? Here, you're forced to have that entire unit as the front line. Um, uh, nothing too exciting elsewhere here. We got the Cav moving this way. Orange is coming back. Wellington's moving his way over. 
uh, to possibly uh, activate some of these units. This thing's still active, nothing I can do about it. So, you know, there is that. Uh, yeah, and where does that put me? I don't know. Oh, here's a sequence of play. Cool. Uh, that's going to put me to French shock. Oh, God. <laughs> All right, we'll think. Well, I just don't know. So, here is an interesting location. I've got a unit facing this. I thought I was so clever to get an enfilade in there. Yeah, except that now there's a line on my flank. And that means if I try to shock combat in my column formation with only a four morale, at the very least I'll probably end up disordered. I'll also probably end up weaker. That's an extended line, so it's probably relatively big. Don't know how big. It's already bigger than me. Uh, I would disorder it by hitting it from the flank. Otherwise, I don't know if there's anything going on. I'm looking around to see if there's, you know, is it in a gap there? It's hard to tell. I see some white, but I think that's uh, informational counters. Eh, shit, there's a leader. Oh, fuck. Okay. Well, we can't do this on camera, obviously. Why it is, I can do it fine one-handed with the tweezers, <laughs> as long as I don't have a camera in the other hand. Uh, somehow, that just fucks with my brain. But yeah, I mean, I'd be attacking at a disadvantage, essentially, because I'm almost certain to be uh, disorganized. Unfortunately, I'm probably going to have to take that fire before I get my flanking fire in on him. Uh, it just puts me in a bad position. What about this attack? Well, that's going against skirmishers and soft cover. We've already learned that, like, I can't shock attack skirmishers and soft cover. I'll end up below the negative two. So, we don't do that. So, yeah, basically this just ends up as a firefight across the board with no shock combat. That doesn't sound like the Waterloo I recall. <laughs> yeah, like... I don't know. <laughs> All right. Well then, no, uh, no French shock, it appears, which will show me the artillery phase. We have some new artillery in place. We unlimbered some guns here to play with these guys. Uh, we got some unlimbered up there that might, might be able to shoot something. I don't know. Visibility looks unlikely because they're at the same level. I'm on a descending slope, but actually I'm below, am I not? Uh, I'm below him. Maybe I can see him. He's right about the peak. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> uh, what would that be? Because the problem is, see, the way the game does it is it just assumes, I think it's assuming big lips, like that each of these slopes is much steeper than, than I accept. And I'm accepting it as a relatively gentle slope. As a relatively gentle slope, then the question is, where am I here, and if we get... A straight edge. We can see. That there's basically two hexes here. And two hexes behind. Which to me says I'm right around the crest of the hill. Now again the slope is relatively gentle. So you can probably see the tops of my heads at least. Probably a lot more than that. Um, the problem, of course, is they're 10 meter layers, so like, yeah. But if we were to divide this out and say, look, uh, this is exactly 10 meters higher than this, and this is the peak, then we would be looking at... Well, no, this would still be the top point. Yeah, fuck it. I, they can see them. 
Okay, uh, sure. Now, here, oh shit, there's, see I got the map. I could not find a way to put the map so that like everything lined up right. I'm not sure why. <laughs> like this looks like it should be underneath. Uh, but anyway, we'll do our best. Um, because this is sunken road type terrain, it doesn't actually impact me. Now what's weird about it is it's the same height. So it's not all that sunken. Could just be hedges. If it's hedges, you'd think they'd block, but they don't. <laughs> the allies won the first fire. Now, this is, again, kind of fucked up. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. These guys are close enough they're in column. I probably want to shoot them. I'm able to. But I do that, and then I lose the first fire here. Which means, I guess I might as well go over here, but I've got a whole bunch of shots over here. There's really just one cannon situation that's of any interest, which is this line up here. So I guess it just doesn't matter. There are some over here. They are not able to counter battery me or anything. So yeah, it kind of just doesn't matter. In the ass about the reciprocal fire, I'm finding myself having to be on that side of the table to judge shots coming from here and on this side of the table for shots coming from here. I didn't have that problem when I was all over here, kind of close, but most of the fighting is happening kind of right in the middle of the table. And I'm just finding myself having to walk back and forth for each shot. At least now, I don't know. <laughs> here we have a sighting situation that is of some importance. I'm looking to sight between these two. There's a hill in between us. And TSS rules would be this hill is closer to the defender than it is to the attacker, so it shouldn't be sighted. And that's what I would go with, but let's see what, what our system does. Uh, that, yeah, <laughs> yeah, let's work through the sighting and see what, what, what this will create. In part, I'm curious because if it does generate the same results as the TSS system for that intervening hill, I would rather use the simpler system, right? As opposed to this, maybe I would just rather use the simpler system no matter what. Where, where was sighting here? It's this line. Which of the two units is the higher? Yeah. You know, by the time I get to this fucking annoying system to watch through, I'm already, like, lost. Where am I? You know, where am I in the battlefield, right? Okay. So this is the higher. Right? Where, what am I shooting? I'm shooting this. I don't even know if I can see it. No, I'm shooting this straight down the line. Okay. So this is the higher. What do we need to do? Count the number of hexes from the hex occupied by the higher to the last hex, which is higher than the lower unit. The actual distance doesn't matter, huh? Okay. Uh, that's going to be one, two, three hexes. I'll put a three there. Do I have to do anything else? I don't think so. But I have to keep this number in mind. Count the number of hexes from the first hex at the same level as the elevation of the lower browsing unit. Uh, that's going to be one. Right? I don't know. <coughs> Count the number of hexes from the first hex, which is to the lower observing unit. 
Okay, that's going to be two, I think. So I range from here to here. That's one. Oh no, that's one, because it's all downslope. This this is counting against me. Okay, that's the problem I have. That's where it gets weird. This is this should have no effect whatsoever. Right? What's happening is I'm getting the same effect as if I'm right below the lip here. Uh, again, I I don't know. I don't know if I like this. Uh, but it, I think it's going to come out that I can't see it. But I think I'm going to just go with the TSS style, which is, look, this is one, two, three hexes away. This is two hexes away. I can't see it. I'm lower down, uh, and that thing's closer. It'll block me. Um, now, CWB would go with, I can't see it because it goes down, up, and back down. And that's enough. That's enough to prevent it. Uh, that would not always be the case, though. <laughs> so I kind of like fiddling around, but I'm going to say these can't see each other, but I might be able to see that thing. And I got to make my fire decision on that with this unit because I started over on that side before I decide whether this unit can fire. Um, that's monotonically increasing. It's on a crest, as far as I can tell. So I think I can shoot that and I'll take the crap shot. Instead of breaking the reciprocal ordering there, it was fine, nothing was shooting. The one unit where there was any, any concern, we got back by before I did that. But I ended up firing both of these before I fired these three. Uh, it's just too easy to get confused and start, start working down the line. Plus. Every time I switch, I, again, I have to switch sides at the table. Although, each shot that succeeds generally means I make like three runs over there <laughs> to get to chips or whatever, just because that's where the counters can, can survive, but also the tracks and whatnot. Um, Two-player game, you'd still have problems, right? I'm here concentrating on this. I got to run over there and move the markers. Uh, but if you're playing this in more than, you know, in like four or five people, four to six people, whatever, uh, you could have somebody who's sitting near the counter, near the uh, tracks, uh, deal with those particular tracks. So that, that's not a big deal. And you'd probably have, you know, counter mix near each player as well with more table space and all that. Uh, I'm too fatigued to do the reciprocal infantry fire. I hope I remember because <coughs> this is really weird for me to pause here. But I'm just, I, I, I spent too much effort and too many steps back and forth to, uh, uh, to hit the, uh, uh, the artillery fire. The effects of it have been fairly impressive in terms of knocking down some of those skirmishers, clearing the way over here, uh, but I don't know how much it's all going to matter in the, in the long run. And also, each shot uses up ammo, you know? Soft cover or not, I was getting kind of lucky with the French. They got like three, three or four hits, I don't know. Uh, I think they got three hits with three artillery. Nah, they missed with one of them. Guess they got two hits with three artillery. Still, it was fairly lucky. Uh, <laughs> But uh, yeah, I'm, I'm just in no condition to, uh, to now start working my way down the lines, especially since the fire is getting more and more intensive and it's time for me to go. So it's shooty, shooty, shooty time. The French get first choice. And it's weird because in terms of the narrative and everything, this is an absolutely gamey measure to the game. Uh, what, which part of the line do I want to fire first? And it really comes down to this unit. These guys are out of range. Um, or over here. <laughs> There's something kind of cool about picking over here because I jump quickly. 
If I pick here though, I'm ahead of the Brits as well, so I can force them either way to fire, uh, to choose the other direction. They absolutely will have to. Um, I don't know which is more important. It may come down to how many skirmishers I have in this hex, but on the other hand, not taking yeah, that that's that's going to be a minimum range fire. But yeah, I, you know, and I shouldn't even be going into this. I should just come back and give the narrative as to what happens, because it's really it's you know it's like playing I don't know. <laughs> It, it, it's, it's choices that have nothing to do with the reality of the situation is the problem. It's kind of funny, the size of these skirmisher stacks, which was such a big bonus at some points, get me over to the second column, doesn't really matter with the soft cover or hard cover. It matters skirmisher versus skirmisher, but it doesn't matter when I'm all the way over. I don't know what that means. So, the fire combat line doesn't take that long to fire, but it does take something out of me. All the running back and forth, all the leaning over and everything. Uh, so what did we get out of it? Well, you can see a big gap opened up here. Uh, we knocked a couple of those extended line units routing back. Otherwise, there were a fair amount of casualties. We got the uh, allies... Ranging down, getting close to 280. Uh, the French getting close. They're, they're just under 220 or 320. And that's going to put me on the Allied command phase. But, you know, the French are in a rush. Uh, they have to bring those numbers down. The British, the Allied numbers down. They have to break the Allied army. And really the goal is to do it before the Prussians come in. But... I don't know how, how plausible that is. Uh, what have we, we dropped them? We've dropped them about 40 points since here. One, two, three, four turns. So 10 points a turn. <laughs> that would be 28 more turns. Well, that would be down here. So at the rate of combat that we're seeing right now, we are not going to be anywhere near breaking them. Of course, if we get... Hugues and La Hassan. That's another four turns or so worth of, of points. Uh, l less that we have to get, but I don't see it doing, not even three turns or so. Uh, it just doesn't look to me like uh, the French have any way. You know, if they come in all out, the skirmishers are just going to cut them to pieces. If they come in deploying skirmishers and whatnot, one, they're weakening the effect of their eventual assaults, but also they're slowing down the rate of damage to both sides. And I don't know. Guess we have to use a cav charge. <laughs> Sort of the last tool left that could really, you know, the one that we haven't used yet. We know how that's going to go. <laughs> it's not going to be pretty unless, uh, unless we can get it lined up, uh, something lined up well. The Allied command phase, I decided not to commit anything new. Uh, <laughs> don't see anything I really want to move. The big deal is having Wellington over here able to react. And sure, I might need to move him back to start commanding some of those reserve units. He's the only person who can command all the reserve units. But this is all reserved back here, too. So he's got to run back and forth, which he historically did. Uh, so it, it, even though he probably had a subordinate in charge of the reserve as a whole, it, it works out. Uh, perfectly well that he doesn't. Um, unfortunately, all the other leaders are just as active, but, uh, but just as capable of activity. 
We had a route coming back here, otherwise everything recovered to some extent. One rounded unit here, a bunch of disorders. It's mainly walking through terrain. And that gets us to the French movement. The Allies have let a situation develop that is not good. Uh, convert this into column. We'll have four movement points then. We'll be facing this vertex, it looks like. Uh, one, two, sorry, two to uh, switch facing, three, four, get to the gun. Be right outside the Hugmo, and the problem with that is that if the skirmishers fall back, they start generating a real problem to me with other forces coming in line here. So it's kind of like I need to create a force to hold these guys off to get somebody else back there. We'll see what I can do. Okay, so for the French, building up a line here, slipping some skirmishers in actually. I think these were the routed guys, not sure. And a bunch of artillery to pound uh, those skirmishers. Uh, try to get things there. As well as, I thought about trying to put a unit here, but it would just get shock attacked, right? <laughs> like a single skirmisher against a big stack of skirmishers is not impressive. It's kind of like a single skirmisher against a regular unit in open terrain, more or less. Um, and uh, so, so, I did uh, drop one of my light units or something into a big stack and uh, we're going to try to wipe out this line and then that'll give us like two two more stacks of skirmishers to put in line here. I think the Hugomont is going to fall unless something changes significantly. Although this line is not that strong, the allies have more forces and may be able to push things back and put that into question. Plus, of course, there's the Dutch coming. Uh, threw some cav in the way here. We lost one of our cav units due to the artillery fire. Building up a nice line here. Some artillery support, etc. Stretching all the way up. Broke down another light unit to go for uh, La Hassan. And then Ney dispatched these guys. Now they're wandering out of a sunken road, so they're all disorganized and everything. Cav moving over to this side. Right now, there's no need for Cav, but again, I felt like I would rather dispatch it now. I've got the rest of First Corps ready. Uh, what's his name? Alex over here and Ney. Uh, they can both activate those two and throw them forward if desired. Uh, that's four more four more points on there. I don't I don't want to do that obviously this turn when I can't do it this turn. I want to wait until after next turn's costs come in, right? In order to uh, to send forces forward. Um, Napoleon is heading back contemplating uh, activating the guards. At the very least, he got himself outside of eight hexes, I think. One, two, three, four, five. So that he can move a little bit more quickly uh, and uh, bring things to bear. But, yeah, it's looking like it's gonna get violent. Now, it is the Allied shock phase. I don't know if there's gonna be any or not. Uh, for the most part, it's skirmishers going up against skirmishers for the new stuff. These don't really look appealing shock targets. I think they probably don't have any. Yeah, I think they do not have any. And they didn't declare any charges. I don't know if they had anything in range. I got some cav here, but I got artillery kind of screening it. Nothing that would have given me visibility anyway. And that range is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight out to here. So probably I could have declared charges if I could have seen stuff. Uh, but I'm kind of blocked by my own units and whatnot. Um, I was hoping things wouldn't develop this badly. With <laughs> the Hugmont being significantly threatened, we may just have to fall back on our next movement. Uh, so I think that's going to put it to the next turn, which is a morale turn. 
And now I brought extra dice out, which is problematic because that means that I won't necessarily notice that it's the first turn, first phase of the, uh, or, or it's a new turn, but that's okay. All right, and it's getting to be close to raid time. I don't know. We're on the second of the uh, morale adjustment hourly turns, and that means the French are probably not going to activate anything new this turn. Obviously, we'll do our rally, whatever. Uh, how's our cav? We could put a cav charge going out there. Uh, we're not at. So the way it's worded, charging uh, um, like we wouldn't have to actually complete it, but it would disorder us. Uh, charging artillery, whether it's limbered or not, is problematic. So I don't know. <laughs> that it causes. Well, it causes you to be disrupted. Which might not be a big deal. <laughs> um, of course, that artillery can move and unlimber. And if it does move, it can get close enough that I'd have to actually attack it. Uh, no matter what, I'd come close. I would come close. It, it could place itself so that I have to come close enough that it can fire at me. Probably not a brilliant move. Um, I don't think I have any other cav that's available anywhere. Make and ready to be used. So yeah. <laughs> Interesting because moving over rough terrain for the French doesn't really hurt them. Moving over rough terrain for the Allies does. In the following sense. The the rough terrain for the French, okay, if I walk right up to a, an allied unit and let it shock me, it's a dumb idea. On the other hand, we'll, we'll touch this again. Um, with the allies, they march, yeah, they're affected by shock, but also they're, any kind of attacking type action they're making, counterattacks, whatever, they're gonna take gunfire. <laughs> and, that's much more likely uh, for those disorders to be problematic. Wow. I wonder why nobody went to go deal with him. Oh boy. And he's going to be hard to get back. Let me... There was an allied movement phase. I see I've got a commander here who I was not using. Why don't I move him there to cover that? <laughs> Having to make these fixes, a lot of them because of the weirdness of the command. Uh, so the command rules in Nay versus Wellington were less restrictive and the rallying and whatnot. Um, but also, no matter what, this whole system is just so different and so alien to me. But then we get uh, to the other side of it, which is that if you use the French cav, it'll, it'll be disordered just before the fire phase as well. So, Allied Cav gets a chance to rally, right? Nah, it does not. It does not get a chance to rally either. The French Cav actually gets a chance to rally more quickly, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> you know? <coughs> but yeah, for actual march, it's an issue. Um... So that's the rally phase. We set the uh, points back, uh, 14 points. So we're down to 300 now, basically, uh, to 270 for the Allies. Of course, they'll have to be paying 12 for the units they have active. Slightly modify the optional rule. I'm putting this square marker back here just to indicate that these guys, although they can't be in linear formation, they, they can't be in normal linear formation without going into extended line. They're in the special King's German Legion, British, Hanoverian, that can achieve uh, a deeper rank line. That means they'll fire as the shitty French lines, 
but it gives me a little edge in terms of not having to form up into those stupid extended lines that happen too easily. You can't do this with anything that's over six strength points. It actually gives them a little bit more flexibility than the French units, and I, I'm gonna try to do it elsewhere as well. Um, I don't even remember what I've done. I moved uh, the cav into place here to help interdict this cav from being a danger. The Dutch oozing their way forward, struggling, struggling to make it forward. These guys, I have to change who's where. Um, I'll put that there because I don't know. <laughs> Whatever. Uh, I, I got it confused as to who was what. This is... Oh no, I had it right. I had it right. I need the formation commander to have everything within two hexes. Well, he can, but I can do the best I can. Um, but I guess the biggest thing was I backed away, and this involved a, giving a couple of shots to the French. I think I took one casualty, no morale hit there, to uh, position myself so I'm defending the Hugomont a little bit better. So I don't just lose it to these guys sneaking around the back. Still, you know, I'm working my way across the board, basically. There's very little opportunity for shock again. Um, you know, I could cross here. He's in clear terrain, so he doesn't... Well, he still gets the, the defensive bonus because I'm crossing. Plus, I'd get disordered. Um, that makes it almost impossible for me to succeed. And I'm in line. I'll just trade shots with them, hope I dissolve them all, and then can move forward somehow. This one intrigued me a little bit. This is a unit in column disordered. It's not going to get an additional effect by being disordered, but he still gets soft cover for being behind it, uh, which I think will throw me below the minus two marker, so I can't possibly succeed in chasing those skirmishers away. It feels like skirmishers are... Yeah, they are overpowered in this. Um, to shock. <laughs> I, I feel like skirmishers in other games in the Napoleonic era uh, tend to be chased away. You charge them, maybe they get a shot off at you or whatever, but they fall back. And think about things like Viva Lamp or, or uh, Napoleonic Brigade series. I'm not as familiar with Labatt, uh, but yeah, the, uh, the skirmishers definitely seem like they hold ground in a way that feels completely unrealistic to me. Um, even if I was attacking skirmishers that are out in the open, and again, British or French or whatever, good quality ones, here I'm looking at, it gets a shot at me, I'm coming in in column, say, it gets a shot at me. It's going to do a hit, uh, probably, not guaranteed. Uh, my morale is going to drop to about a two, <laughs> which means I'm probably going to disorder. If I'm already disordered, I'm fucked, which he is. He's probably going to rout in that case. And then the firepower value is so affected by the effectiveness rating. So that effectiveness rating is, you know, I'm a hit down, so instead of a three morale, for, well, let's say, a, let's say I'm a four going down to a three. Um, I'm looking at the minus two table, which, yes, I will beat him on the minus two table. I will beat an individual skirmisher with a unit in column formation that only takes one hit out in the open. You put any kind of terrain for those skirmishers, and they just become impenetrable. Uh, and yeah, that, that I think is a problem. Uh, you try to attack them in line and you will be defeated because you're right at the edge. You're right at the minus two table just for attacking them, basically. <laughs> because your own morale is so low. And, uh, you know, we're talking about French line units here. With They have a four effectiveness, but it drops down to uh, a, a three when they take a hit, right? That means they are at the minus two. If they take a disorder from their fire, which is probably about a little less than 50-50 or whatever, they're just not going to make it. They're going to get flung back. The skirmishers are just too resilient to uh, 
to any kind of uh, shock combat. And they're pretty good at fire combat. <laughs> so as a defensive measure, they look really, really tough to, to overcome. Nate versus Wellington didn't really do anything about this. But why didn't I deploy more skirmishers than on defense? Well, that may be why the French were able to break the Allied army, honestly. Uh, because the game is supposed to be pretty heavily... Uh, it's supposed to be pretty hard to win, win with the uh, French. <sighs> Even if you allow for putting the game in my pocket afterwards. Okay, uh, that means we're going to be at the reciprocal fire. I'm in no mood to do it <laughs> again. Like, fighting my way through the movement, uh, the cumbersome nature of the movement, and, you know, this... I, you know, I don't even think I worried... Jesus, I didn't even think about... Well, I can't change formation where I'm in formation. But I, there are some places back here where maybe I could have changed formation. Let me go back and look at those. Find one more place where I wanted to create one of those silly British, like... <coughs> uh, deeper, deeper line linear formation so that it doesn't go into the extended uh, formation. Unfortunately, this is already an extended and I can't do anything so I'm taking enfilade shots because, yeah, <laughs> it just, and if I, you know, if I switch formation, I take an enfilade shot anyway. Of course, at least then I'd be able to fire. All right, let's do it. Lucky and got away with it. I also moved this line up here because things are too cluttered. You know, again, it's the stupid fucking uh, extended lines and whatever. I got nothing covering here. It probably would have been better off moving it there, but I'm just having such a hard time doing anything like I don't want to do anything, right? This is reminding me of Summer Storm and some other games. Probably uh, Labatt feel, felt the same way, the Battles of the Age of Reason. I feel like it's just so fucking hard to move my pieces, I don't want to bother, <laughs> you know? Um, I don't know. Uh, I'm beginning to think that, like, Napoleonics are just... Yeah, I get my kick out of Evil Emperor, uh, and honestly, Napoleonic Brigade series is still at, at the level at the 3.0 version is still far and away my favorite Napoleonic tactical. Now it's at a brigade level. It's not, you know, somebody mentioned, hey, they wanted a kind of dumb uh, brigade level game. Yeah, well, there's tons of those, you know. Uh, the OCS library is, is that way, uh, or OSG, I'm sorry, uh, getting, getting my brain farts in place. Um, yeah, obviously, the uh, Napoleon at Waterloo system works that way because it's based on it. Uh, the uh, OSG is based on that. Um, I don't want that. I want firepower. I want these, I want these fire exchanges to happen. But... I'm feeling like my units are as unmaneuverable as they are in linear combat in this system. And that isn't right. <laughs> now, that may be me just being clumsy and not using it as effectively as I might, uh, but it, I think it is actually part of what the system actually generates. And NBS gives you a lot more freedom with your movement and whatnot, allows you you know, to do the things you feel like you should be able to do in a Napoleonic uh, battle. I don't feel like I can do the things in terms of maneuvering that I feel like I want, want to be able to do. And some of that is just the scale. And some of it is just the scale. Because if I, you know, again, if this game had larger, if this game had hexes with a larger scale, you wouldn't have any extended line formations. And you would have a firepower limit coming from a hex instead of... Uh, instead of just, oh, just one unit fires, which is more realistic because you might have multiple units, uh, smaller units positioned in the same hex firing out. So you'd have like an eight strength point fire limit or whatever. Uh, that would probably be the right amount. And 
you know, double, double the size of the hex, no extended lines, and, and do that. And you would get a smaller map or one that allowed more maneuver, but I don't feel like that's really appropriate in Waterloo. I feel like there's plenty of room on this map already <laughs> for, for what the battle is. Uh, but you could use smaller maps in general, and you would have less pieces on the board. Positive, negative, I don't know, you know. Uh, but you wouldn't even have to have less pieces, to tell you the truth. I don't know. Anyway. <laughs> This system is not for me. It really isn't. Uh, and I just feel like I'm getting down into the details of trying to keep units from colliding with each other too much in both games that I've played of it. I didn't feel this problem in Monmouth at all, but again, you don't have, you don't have the same issues in Monmouth <laughs> at all. Uh, yeah. All right. I'm done for now. All right. Uh, so the French won first shot, and I am choosing to come from this side because otherwise the Allies might actually get a plink at my artillery. I got to fire closest unit, unless the rules have changed in some way that I'm not aware of. Uh, so that's going to be some stupid skirmishers and not far away to, enough to plow through, but I want to get my shot off. I just noticed I unleashed a gun here that could fire. Uh, not going to happen. Um, it was important that I get this shot off beforehand, so, yeah. <laughs> There's some chance that that skirmisher could hit the artillery and knock it out, though. What I'm seeing is artillery is incredibly effective against skirmishers. I mean, yeah, you're wasting ammo and whatnot, but there isn't much else that gets them out of the way. <laughs> it turned out to be an especially bad choice not to fire here, actually, because now I'm seeing... There are a couple of British guns that have me uh, in, in sights that, yeah, if he started on this end, I could, uh, I could have cut in on them. Oops. He chose not to fire a couple of guns back here, this one, this one, and then that other Dutch gun there, for the simple reason that they're firing at maximum range. <sighs> they got some chance. Well, if they're shooting at, at uh, yeah, you know what, why not? They're shooting at, uh, at, at column units, so it's worth doing. Keep trying to like end early. I really, I, I mean, I, I don't like stopping between the two fire phases, but all the bending and everything and running around back and forth, I'm getting tired. Well, I'd say the French got pretty badly used in this artillery round. Uh, We'll see if the infantry works any better, but we can see the point totals here. They're, you know, close to 20 points apart at this point, which I think is a, a significant gain by the Allies. All right, it's break time. Yeah, the sleeps are getting longer and longer now. <laughs> You know, I took a couple naps yesterday or whatever, and then still ended up sleeping I think a full night's worth. Uh, played a little bit of raid, watched some videos, but now I'm up here. It is the infantry fire phase, apparently. I got that right. Let's see who gets first shot, and then I gotta make the hard decisions. Uh, that's the allies. I don't know where they want to start, you know. It's so easy to fuck this, this part up. Uh, over here doesn't matter. But that is a shot I'd have to make, which is an indication that I probably want to go there late. So let's start over on that end. Just because I, I don't know how much difference the decision makes. I think it's kind of important, but it's like I also don't want to spend my brain energy on something 
that is just absolutely a gamey feature. In addition to the running back and forth each time a casualty is done. Again, this is a solo problem. I've got to. I've got to be clear there. <clears throat> but I have to. And although I don't know, if you're only playing two players, I kind of feel like both players have to be paying some attention over here. And then you flip over and go to the other end of the line. You know. Uh, so I'm having to basically be over there to deal with the stuff that's happening on that side, and then here, and. You know, with most games, it's like I work my way down the line as a convenience and I go sequentially left to right and take care of it all. With this one, I have to interleave each one, so I'm having to change position each time, uh, you know, and focus e e each time that I make a single shot because it is definitely a gamey advantage not to both start on the same side. I think the French did the better over all of this. Got a lot of ammo depletions here, which is what happens when you manage to hit skirmishers in safe terrain. Of course, these guys can't break morale because they're protected. So like their five morale boosts up, they won't fail. That's fine. You wouldn't expect them to. Uh, blew away the line here. Um, not sure much else. We had some hits over here though, which is also of value, uh, I guess, <laughs> I don't know. Uh, the artillery didn't get hit and we're ready to go into the Allied Command phase, but I'm not ready to play it. <laughs> I, I need to get away from this game every time I do something. I, again, I'm finding certain games just end up uh, relatively tedious this way. Uh, just <sighs> working down the line, etc. Yeah, I, I, I would feel the same with any other big battle. I mean, I, I was talking recently, somebody was like, wow, that's a big map. And I'm like, yeah, you know, I did uh, uh, Le Bata, the Leipzig over there which is actually, let's see, the two and a half times the size. There are games that don't fit in my loft that, I have, that I've played. Uh, in fact, the very first one that I, I did was uh, uh, the full seven days uh, CWB campaign or, or game, which uh, that was nine maps. It was, it's kind of funny because the biggest thing I had played before that was three maps, either TSS or the Central Front Series. Now you can say, well, your Central Front Series was five maps. Yeah, but it wasn't back then. <laughs> I only had the three original maps. Um, so yeah, I mean, I guess you could, you could make an argument that, I guess things like Whiff and stuff I had played that were on f uh, four maps as well, but they're not connected, you know? <laughs> So yeah, this is uh, this is not all that big. Although reaching into the center hurts the old back. I'm I'm just talking because I want to talk. You know, I don't I don't get to play because playing is too tiresome. All right, let's uh, let's uh, let's stop. As I was heading down the stairs, I was thinking, uh, you know, the complexity. Maybe you're playing, you're doing everything yourself, right? Two-player, yeah, it would still probably be problematic, but maybe this is one of those games that's designed for, like, you know, three players per side. Certainly the, the concept is present in the designer's idea, and this is the kind of thing you see played at, like, Consum World or something along those lines. My own experience has been the more people you put into a battlefield like this, you know, a, a tactical battle game, the more I want the game to be simpler, right? <laughs> like, generally, there might be a couple of diehards who kind of understand the roles. Most of the rest of the players are just there pushing pieces, 
in most most scenario, most situations that I've seen with these kind of big big battles. So, you know, with TSS, yeah, the system was easy enough that I could bring players up to speed. I don't feel like that's possible with this. Now, obviously, look, you know, maybe if everybody's up on the rolls and knows what they're doing and everything, it works fine. That's just not been my experience usually. And obviously, you know, if I go to Concept World and sign up to play uh, Wellington's Victory, I, everybody expects I'm going to know the rules and know how to handle the pieces, unless I say other, you know, unless something is written otherwise in the intro or whatever. I think, I'm not sure, uh, like I'm thinking, I brought La Grand Guerre there and the two people who, who signed up for it, both of them were familiar with the roles, neither one had ever played it or tried to. So it's like, you know, you might have people who have a grasp, maybe fiddled around with some pieces and whatnot, but they also might never have had that experience and that's why they're doing it. Um, I don't remember, I, I think I put that I would teach <laughs> and fully expected to because I know it's a, a, a rarity of a game. But the people I got actually were familiar with it, just not as familiar. I, I don't know. Anyway, <laughs> right, so I took advantage of the Allied command phase. The first thing essentially really is taking off the points. Now they're down to 250 basically, as opposed to 290 for the French. So I caught things at a, at a bad moment for the French, basically, in between when they paid their cost and, and the Allied units uh, pay theirs. We had a bunch of rallying going on. Not this unit. I don't know what's up with him. He's rallied. It's hard, it's hard to keep track of... Um, of all the units is one of the problems. And now that's disordered, so that's okay. I gotta worry about my disordered units. Did I flip them over without throwing them into extended line? And yes, I did so without checking, but uh, I don't know if I... I've only got a couple of routed units. This one's a skirmisher, which shouldn't have routed. So how about that? <laughs> You know, I mean, I just see the routed marker, and I'm like, oh, but this is a real unit that got routed uh, in the last fire phase and hasn't had a chance to get a commander on top of them. I'm not going to activate any more units, even if the situation kind of uh, encourages it. I don't know. I mean, yeah, there would be reasons to bring some of these forward, but let's wait a turn. Let's wait a turn. I might be brought in on my own or, or involuntarily by uh, French units contacting me. Um, and that means we're on to the French movement uh, period. Now, one other thing that I forgot to mention, for the first time in the game, we got some calf charges. And these are going to cause a whole cacophony of morale checks for the French. Even the Cav have to check to see if, uh, if they hold morale under a charge zone. I see the argument either way. Okay. One thing is missing, which was on the Nay versus Wellington uh, board, but is not on this board, and is not on the player aids is the modifiers to the morale checks, which means basically I have to kind of fake them or hunt for them every time, which is almost certainly not going to happen. A little surprised by that. Where did I find that you got a morale bonus? Like I think I looked here and gave myself a morale bonus for terrain, and I'm not, I'm not sure you get one. There certainly are places on the map where more space could have been devoted to charts. <laughs> There's a lot of the map that's just not going to get used, right? Uh, you know. 
we going to go up in those hills? I don't know. Uh, but we, you do get protection from cover. Command unit is worth one, which is weird because like if a command unit gets shot out from under you, you're supposed to check um, after the command unit is shot out. I don't think it gets replaced somewhere else. I think it just gets flipped over. There's still one there. I get rid of that advantage for the turn that he's shot. Um, but, uh, you know, flipped over command units, the only thing they really do is they make command and control more difficult. Well, I've mostly given up on command and control. I can't cope with it. <laughs> like, I think units are moving. Like, every now and then I notice, oh, I'm failing. I guess I don't get to move. Um, medium range and minimum range are plus one, plus two. Uh, the other thing I wanted to check is when the hell do I get my ammo back? Again, new rule for this game compared to Nave versus Wellington. Obviously, this is the earlier game. That is friendly command phase. Okay, so I should be looking for the allied ammo markers. I think they have one over there, and that, that is able to trace its ammo. That means the French are going to go through their movement phase without getting their ammo back. But... That's not that big a deal, right? Because there's no fire. Yes, it has a morale effect, but again, it's the Brits who are mainly defending, so it probably isn't gonna be that big a deal. They're probably not gonna do a lot of shock combat. This French flank a little bit more disrupted now. Some more, some disrupted unit, or so routed unit chased back, a disrupted unit chased, whatever. Uh, Put, it, put it in an uglier position. I'm doing that in the facing formation phase rather than sort of that combined facing formation movement because I just want to focus on this. This is a special case that's not happening very often in the game overall. And now I gotta figure out what the hell to do about it all. And a little bit of the movement on the extreme right flank of the French army. Uh, I'm going to tell you, I may have mentioned this before, I don't know. Most of this game is happening in kind of the very center of the map. Now, at least so far. <laughs> and that's a pain in the ass because you really have to reach. One of the reasons for tweezers, but they extend your fingers a little bit. But... Uh, you know, I, I started thinking about it, and most of the other big games I have, not, it's not usual for all of the action to be happening in the center. It feels a little strange that it wouldn't be, but, <laughs> but quite often um, key elements of the fighting happen at various different points uh, on the map, and that the center is not actually where most of the fighting happens. Uh, I'm trying to remember. I think Leipzig had happened kind of in the center, which was painful. Um, a lot of it did. But, you know, like, I think about my first, which was uh, Terrible Swift Sword. Things kind of happened on the edges always. The center was like the field, <laughs> the, big, the big expanse that you have to march through. And, yeah, you take hits while you're going through it. But there's not a lot, there's not a lot of actual, like, close-in engagement there. And uh, I'm not going to count things that aren't two maps wide anywhere. So like, you know, DAC and, uh, and Central Front Series and stuff. Those, those were all one mappers. Yeah, you might have to have modular tables to make it so you can reach everywhere. Uh, hmm. La Retour de l'Empereur was, had, had movement zones between the maps, so that doesn't really count. Seven days, I remember there was a brief period where there was some fighting right in the center of that. And that was hell, because that was nine maps arranged in kind of, you know, a, a rectangle. So that center map was in a really, really bad position. And I remember really having to reach to get there. Uh, we didn't see a lot of fighting there, but some. Hmm. 
I don't think what else I have this big. I don't know. <laughs> but it, it is definitely an issue when you, when you have to, you know, reach that far. The, the game's, I don't know. And, and, and this body is getting older. So I'm looking at this unit here. It's a six strength point unit. I can't advance it how I want to without disrupting it. Because it'll be divided by the, uh, by the soft cover. But I can dispatch a skirmisher, make it a five point unit and advance in line. <laughs> As I continue working my way down here, fourth core, moving up to uh, join between those two, kind of leaving this as my reserve probably to deal with the Prussians better than fourth core. Uh, that's like first core stuff. Uh, I've got like, I don't know, there was a lost unit here somewhere, unable to be in command. I think this one because I moved the commander there. Um, because the commander ran back with a routed unit and I had to get his commander to go rally that unit while he goes and commands his troops because his commander can't command stuff within his command range. In fact, he can't do shit with his command range as far as I can tell. The only damn thing he can do with his command range is he can uh, activate new units. It's I feel like the command rules for this are far too cumbersome uh, in, in too many ways. I, I may just loosen them and say anybody in your direct sequence of command can command those, can command units within its command range instead. Of course, that would make the original Napoleon at an 8.6 as opposed to the kind of not so healthy Napoleon. Um, really horrible, <laughs> like way, way powerful. And, and Wellington as well, which, you know, the game's not designed for it, but it's like, uh, it's designed to be too painful. Uh, you have to keep units within like two hexes of their commander. One hex if the commander gets shot, and it just means that the formations aren't able to spread out the way I want them to, but maybe that's intentional. Maybe that's intentional. Um, there was something I wanted to say, and then I got caught in all these tangents. What the fuck was it? Oh yeah, I think I erred. I don't think I could have, uh, I don't think I could have deactivated the one unit that I deactivated back here for the allies. Um, I'm looking and the range, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, there was at least one in here. So that's going back. That's going back up, and this goes down another one. So a unit that I moved up on the ridge with the hopes of deactivating it. Uh, yeah, the fighting's getting too close. I'm not able to. And that's one of the costs of <laughs> activating your units. It may actually make more sense to leave your front line, if you've got channels going through it, leave your front line in position like I kind of have here, and advance units from the rear because you're not going to get that you're not going to get the defensive position that you want um and be de and not be costing yourself morale for activated units and control issues become especially weird when you start hitting areas like here where you know maybe a whole division is broken down <laughs> into skirmishers and i've got like this whole command structure I don't know what they're there for. They can't really help the skirmishers, I guess. Uh, you know, I can run them around in the backfields and use them as rallying implements and whatever. But you've got this feeling, you're looking at it and you're like, hmm, what's the 129? Where's that? Maybe he should be near his unit. And you just can't be sure, you know. It's more like you find a unit that's out of place and then you try to find the commander who can, who can move it threatened by anything but cavalry I formed a bunch of squares <laughs> um, yeah there's some artillery that can plunk me um, that's life I guess but uh, it's at a distance and whatnot and it'll take take some ammo um, I've got these cav here facing I, I'm expecting it's going to just turn into a cav battle over there. I feel kind of dumb forming squares because I'm going to get shot up by the artillery, but, you know, I, my option 
is to let the calf charge me. And unlike most games on the Napoleonics that I'm used to, there's no opportunity to change to square except right here. This is my time to do it. I don't get like a, ah, oh, yeah, he's aiming at me. I'd better form a square, which always felt a little weird to me. Like, it felt like infantry units were able to uh, defend themselves a little too well. Uh, so this actually, there's many things about this game that I feel, feel right. Uh, they just are at the expense of playability in a lot of cases. And, you know, you can change into square automatically. Yeah, you had to make a morale check first. But a lot of these other games require that if you're going to change into square at the time of the charge, you basically have to make a roll for it. And, yeah. Um, pretty close to done. I've got to find somebody to command this. Who the hell is this? Well, he's probably not who I want there. Wow, my cab is not happy. These guys are disordered. They're not doing anything. Yeah, I'll fling him back here. Now, wherever I've got leaders on top of counters, it's hard to tell that it's a routed unit. And I, this is where I often find, ooh, did I screw up last time I had a chance to rally? And last time I had a chance is not anywhere near when I'm looking at the units again. So there's a lot of capability for like uh, stuff either missing its rally or getting a rally it shouldn't because I notice and think I missed a rally. <laughs> that is going to put me on the allied shock phase and I need a break, man. Maybe I'll be able to do the uh, French phase, uh, the French uh, uh, command and rally <laughs> after I do the Allied shock. But yeah, that, I mean, there's just too much going on. The movement is too complicated, too cumbersome. Um, we got units uh, pushing in through here. They're going to uh, get rid of those ammo markers. Uh, the Allied Shock is when I decide whether or not I do the Cav Charges. So, well, I don't decide whether or not. I do them. Uh, whether or not they hit anything is the question. It's three hexes I have to, have to move and then I can call it off. Uh, and that'll still disrupt the Cav units and put them at a weaker place in comparison to the French units. So, like, Halting the infantry is not that big a deal, right? Like I may be, that cav may be blown for a significant amount of time if um, I, it may get knocked out uh, for trying a charge, which again, feels right. Uh, trying to see if there's anywhere else. I mean, there's possibilities of a shock combat there, but for the most part, I think the only shock combat I'm gonna see is the calf. I do need a little bit of a break though. Okay, I gotta bend over to get by my light here. <laughs> uh, <coughs> I need it close so that I can, I mean, I could go around, but I'm too lazy for that. Um, let's take a look at some of these allied charges. So I've created charge zones here now. In this particular game, not in Nay versus Wellington, they uh, suggest putting a third charge zone marker on the cav unit itself. I think actually it probably is not a bad idea because I might have chosen not to charge with all my cav. I have to pick one and launch an attack. Now here I'm facing a disordered six strength points of cav. I probably don't want to launch there but I actually don't have an option. That's the one I have to do. So we're gonna come here, and now he gets to make a counter charge check, I believe. He may not because he's disordered. Let me check that. <laughs> the rules on charge, there's a lot of them. <laughs> and it's been a while since I've done the charge counter charge. 
uh, and stuff like that. I couldn't actually find counter charge rules in this. I found the opportunity charge. I'll be back. Counter charge is added in Nay versus Wellington. Um, and I'm not sure exactly why. <laughs> I, uh, because it looks like the opportunity charge allows enough, but I'm disordered, so I don't get to opportunity charge. So this is attacking uh, four, I, I, this doesn't get to counter charge, four to six, which means I'm gonna be uh, 75% over here. I've got a five versus a five, which means no modifiers for that, but there's a minus two for disordered here, or say plus two for the attacker. Plus two general modifier for the attacker. Um, take one off for the leader, so I'm at plus one. Add one for the height differential, I'm at plus two. Add one for the cav impetus because I'm not being countercharged. Uh, I'm kind of making that up. I couldn't find, well, the impetus is in here. I couldn't find what happens if an opportunity charge, like if this guy had done an opportunity charge against me, essentially a countercharge. Where did I get? <laughs> uh, plus two, plus three, plus two, plus three. So I'm going to be at 75% on the plus three table here. Where I'm going to cause a DR. Now, a DR. Let's look this up. Disordered unit retreat, no loss. Adjacent friendly units must check morale and a plus one penalty. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, I'm looking to see. I think this is one that causes... I think it's going to route them, but uh, the must immediately retreat on the adjacent friendly units. Okay, where is the, if you get a DR, DR1, it treats it as a route if you're disordered already. So yeah, so we're going to take two hits of damage uh, to the French unit. There's not going to be any follow-up charges because there are no units immediately adjacent, so that's going to just disorder the allied unit. My second charge, I'm slipping in under the charge radius, uh, or, or outside the charge radius for this unit. He's facing this way. So he doesn't get a chance to counter, and I get to hit him. I'm hitting him in the flank, that disorders him. I'll move the marker there, but we are four at five versus two at five. That means I'm going to be at 200% ratio. I have double the strength. Our values are pretty much the same, but I get plus two because he's disordered. And do, 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 do. anything else? I don't see anything else. We both have leadership. That's going to be a DR. That's going to be, again, a route, so it'll do two hits. I do a leader loss check for him. I, uh, I didn't mark this. This guy, sh yeah, I did mark it. This guy was injured in his as well. Uh, so two hits, a route, and then again, my charge stops. Perhaps unwisely, I declared all three of these as charges. This guy's got a charge at, towards something. Since everybody's in square, I'm going to stop there. That's going to disorder him as well. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about the strategic choice. I, I probably should have only charged two of them, but that would have meant leaving a unit behind. Feels to me like when they're disordered, they should have a chance to withdraw. I'm kind of hanging out there. Another line of cav could smack into me, whatever. I don't know how much I believe that, uh, but anyway, like there's no cav recall in this, um, like there is in, say, NBS. Of course, the turns are only 15 minutes, so things are a little different. So what did, what did I gain other than smacking some units up, which is good, by making this charge? Two things. One, I slowed down the advance here, but more importantly, I cleared the way 
for my flanking forces to come in without a problem. The French are going to have to deploy another cav unit or rally these units or something to provide some sort of threat to slow down their advance. <laughs> so I feel like I did the right thing by launching my charge. That's going to put me to the game turn end and then the French command phase. Uh, I don't feel like I need a break yet, so we'll keep going. French units up here doing what they can to recover. Uh, they're behind the curve though. The British will recover first. Of course, this would have been the time to declare the charge. I didn't have anybody up here to, uh, to bring this cav into play, did I? This is second core. Uh, second core is quite far away. They're over here. I have to dispatch somebody over, over to uh, bring them into play if I want them in play. So what I did was I had Kellerman bring his cav in. It's possible I could get picked off here and brought back, brought into things. But yeah, I'm bringing in uh, another cav division here of the third cav. And, or I don't know what it is. <laughs> um, and I'm bringing in part, another division of the first core to move in to this position. I feel like I got, uh, what is this? This is actually sixth core. I keep calling it fourth, being dyslexic and whatever. They should be able to cover the line here, connecting up the two units um, or, or the two segments of line. So the first core is going to probably swing uh, that, that division forward. You know, individual brigades can work on their own. It would feel a lot better if uh, the divisional commander could do more than just command his one hex. But whatever. Um, ammo depletions have been recovered. We're on the Allied uh, formation in March. I'm not really in position right now uh, to, to go right ahead. So we're going to pause there and take care of their movements. After completing a movement of a different kind and finding I was still wearing my gaming glasses, <laughs> or at least this game glasses, um, came back up to start doing the movement. I started moving some of these uh, here, but I came to an interesting realization. You can recall the cav. Again, it's baked into the, the sequence of play. I made my charge, I'm disrupted. Now I get a movement opportunity to pull them back, reform. I like that. Uh, the game, the, the peculiarities and in interleaving of the um, sequence of play, I complain about it a lot of times because it's a pain in the ass to get used to. It's a pain to deal with in certain ways, but it does provide for some cleaner, less rules intensive ways of uh, allowing what should happen to happen. So instead of having a, call, a cav recall phase, you know, at the end of charge or whatever, instead of having a special rule for that, I just happen to have the movement at the time where it allows me to do, do that reform. That's assuming I'm in command. These guys are not. They're stuck out there. They do not get to recall. That's kind of a problem. <laughs> That meant I couldn't pull my disordered cab back as far as I'd like to, but it's okay. I got reinforcements coming uh, to solidify them on this side. I've got these forces here uh, moving forward a little bit. Shifted things around a little bit here, not much, just like getting more into, uh, into the human itself, because it is the key. Um, Tried to tilt units so that I can tell that there's a, uh, a different colored marker under them for disorder. If, if I was using the same colored markers for disorder, which I can't for the red, but feels like it would be the right thing to do, uh, that little trick would not help me very much. And in some cases, I'm probably not doing it effectively. Got a big problem. Wellington 
he feels like he has to uh, throw some more units into play here to help defend this area. He's in a good place to do that. He can reach as far as these guys, which is good enough for me uh, to try to defend La Hassan. But I also feel like I need to bring up some of the R units here. I think I can wait a little longer, but that may indicate creating too much pressure on, uh, on the Hugmont. Broke down some uh, guards units into skirmishers because they were pretty small at this point. These poor suckers, I can't do anything with them. They've taken, they've released their skirmishers or whatever. They're sitting there in column in front of the guns. I'm hoping to pick the guns off. That's the best I can do. Uh, not a whole hell of a lot happening overall. That's going to put me to French shock. Let me think about whether there's going to be any. Because <laughs> then I can just shift down to, to uh, the firepower phase. I have uh, some places over in here where it might look like it's a good idea. Um, I think these guys are protected. Maybe not. So what would happen? Well, they'd be shooting at a line. They'd have a five or... Oh. Messy, messy, messy. They'd have a five or a six to go in. Once, uh, it would give me a nice protected place for my units versus uh, these thicker allied lines here. <sighs> Jeez. But if I did, let's see. If, if I was shot at, it would be a 5 or a 6, and what's my morale like? My morale could be as low as a 1, which would be the minus 4 table. As it is, it's the minus 3 table. I have no chance of dispersing those skirmishers. None whatsoever. That's bullshit, man. Um, it's just bullshit. <laughs> There's no, no protection. This is clear terrain. I've got, actually, I got a point because I'm higher, ter, uh, higher elevation. But it, it, it's bullshit that, like, a relatively healthy French line cannot move against the skirmishers. So, in general, like, I just dismiss, oh, I'm next to skirmishers, I can't attack them. Like in places like here. It is really uh, an unreasonable situation, I believe, that this uh, system creates. Um, what about this disordered unit? Can I march on that? Well, I could from this one. That's not in a minimum artillery zone. I'm, fuck. I'm facing a kind of weak unit there. That is a two morale unit. I'm probably a two morale unit as well. I am line going against column. That doesn't hurt me because I'm not extended line. Uh, strength point wise, I'm at a reduced strength quality. I'm not gonna. I'm gonna be at a hundred percent. It's basically. I give them a fire that they're not likely to be able to hit me with. So let's do that. It's very seldom that you find any shock combats that work. So here, I've got uh, disordered units firing at line. They need a five or a six to hit. They do so, so I could be in trouble. Now my morale is down to a one. I get, I get a disorder marker, so I'm not thrown completely out. Uh this unit. Uh, so I have a one morale. He has a two morale. So I'm at one, minus one on morale at 100%. And that's it. Puts me here. Not a great result. I'm probably going to route. Get a five. I actually end up routing them, which does two hits to them 
and sends them flying and puts me up to the guns. That gives me an opportunity to then attack the guns, but I would be undergoing minimum range fire zone from them. I'm going to be taking that anyway, so maybe I do? I don't know. Say I survive fuck, the firepower. In the sense that I'm not routed. I think that's impossible, to tell you the truth. I think that's impossible. This is going to be minimum range fire, uh, I think a six-point gun, moderate versus a line. I'm going to take hits. That's going to drop my morale to like zero. <laughs> so I can't, I can't continue. I can't afford to continue. Uh, is that terrible? I don't know. Um, but now I'm going to get shot anyway during the fire combat phase, but I think I'd rather have it happen than I guess. I don't know. You know, it doesn't make much difference. Uh, I'm screwed for having broken through. Uh, was I screwed anyway, though? Yeah, probably. So at least I, at least I routed that unit uh, before I get routed myself. Um, here, I'm up against skirmishers. So I'm at a minus two morale to begin with. If they hit me, that's on a five or a six they do, I'm at minus three and I fail. <laughs> and thus get a worse fire combat. So I don't want to advance against skirmishers. Never, never attack skirmishers. You can't clear them out of the way. That is just such, uh, it, it's absolutely wrong. Um, coming over here, uh, I'm pretty sure I don't want to go into this sunken road in a square formation. So that is probably it for my uh, shock combat. I did one, perhaps the most successful shock combat I've seen yet this game. I don't know. I've, I had somewhere I had like a big stack of skirmishers knocked knock out a single skirmisher or something. Uh, but yeah, for the most part, you just can't afford it because anything but skirmishers loses morale for every hit that it takes. And then the disorder and everything else, it's just, I got no chance, no chance against, uh, against most, of, most of the units. And it just, it doesn't feel at all appropriate. Skirmishers should not be gods. <laughs> um, why aren't they in Nay versus Wellington? The rules are essentially the sh same. Well, why aren't they? I'm not sure. I think they st still should be on the defensive. On the offensive, I saw them as not being applicable because I needed to try to force the fight. So I didn't want a huge stack of skirmishers. I, I didn't want to create as many skirmishers as I could have. And I think that worked out okay, but I don't think it would have worked had the allies deployed a bunch of skirmishers. Um, one of the things that helped me as well was that I had the allies deployed behind the stream. <laughs> which I think that's going to be a good thing. Well, it turns out the way terrain is represented in that game. Behind the stream was no good because the banks were higher on the attacking side. So I counted, the stream itself does nothing. So I counted as being able to go down slope and getting a plus one on, on the attack there. Now that's a possibility in some of these areas. Let's say I send a skirmisher against a skirmisher. That would have no chance of hitting, right? Well, okay, first, first I would get shot at, which would mean I'd get a hit on a one and I'd be gone. But if I didn't do that, if that didn't happen, I wouldn't be disordered for going through the woods. I'd be getting basically 100% on the plus one column, which is slightly to my advantage. If I wanna press the, the situation, the formed unit, forget that. That, that can't attack skirmishers. <laughs> it can't scare them away. Uh, but the actual skirmisher might be a good idea to push forward. 
because I'd be going from here with higher terrain. I'd be at a plus one coming in. No, because the skirmisher would have soft cover still, even though I wouldn't get the disorder. So he would get that. It would end up an even roll with me giving him first shot, which could just destroy me. So yeah, we're done. <laughs> Taking a break again. Huh. I feel like I want to eat again. So I, this is one of the problems with, with this is I don't have a lot of raid to do right now. I mean, I could, but I, I, there's, there's disadvantages to me doing so. I don't have a lot of raid to do. Um, and I'm playing this. I play a little bit of it. And then I'm like, yeah, but what do I do now? And my, you know, I feel a little hungry whenever. And I've eaten <coughs> not much. Some peanut butter and jelly crackers and an egg with some hash. So it's not that bad, but like, I don't know. I really have to learn to just survive while I'm hungry because otherwise I seem to be putting on about five pounds a year. Yeah, I couldn't help myself. Had a hot dog. <laughs> uh, okay. So reciprocal artillery, the French get first shot. I'm looking over the board and I don't see many places where there's competition to tell you the truth <laughs> on the artillery fire. So it kind of doesn't matter where I start. Okay, the artillery fire phase done. Uh, I don't know that much happened. One key element is that these guys were in a sunken road in their uh, square. They could have been hit by the cav so it was not a bad move, but the artillery basically ends up, you know, crapping out. Uh, I also found that the artillery I've got set up here can't do shit against the skirmishers that are in place. Even if I'm firing over at the best stuff I can, hard cover, I only hit on a six if I'm not a quality three gun. I have a couple quality three guns in there. I can't, I can't hit them. I could hit the soft cover stuff, which is what I've been mainly firing at previously. Uh, I don't know. A lot of really low odds attacks, like low chance attacks happening, uh, which feels like it's kind of the nature of this. <laughs> it's like, well, yeah. I hate using ammo for this, but fuck it, I kind of have to. It is still a tedious and slow process that doesn't generate a lot of results, and <laughs> I'm not ready to do the infantry fire at this point anymore. We got a route here that was kind of impressive, kind of beat up on these guys. That center's falling. You know, um, somebody commented over on BGG, they're, they're doing it the same, uh, pretty much, uh, you know, starting before I started this and continuing. They're doing the same, uh, sa same game and uh, playing it what I think is more historically. So I've brought the Brits down off the ridges, very unwellington here, right, uh, to defend the Hugemont, uh, to try to make it a harder nut to crack instead of just maybe funneling skirmishers down there or whatever one should be doing to make it impossible because what initially starts there is not enough to hold it, right? But I'm bringing additional forces down, which is probably good for the French because they want to get, you know, the, the Allied army to crack before, uh, before the Prussians come in. But... It actually looks like they're doing a pretty damn good job, the French are, in that, of, uh, of smacking uh, the Allies around up on the crests. So, yeah, I'm not so sure how big a difference it makes, to tell you the truth. Um, it's not like the units hiding on the reverse slope are going to make much difference Firing artillery at long range just doesn't do shit, basically. It might disrupt your, your enemy a little bit or whatever, but it's not, not that big a deal. I also find, found another anomaly 
where the sighting situation actually worked, but it was awfully close to not working, which was um, sighting from here to this hill here. If I was a hex further back, I think I fail, regardless of what's behind me or anything like that. Now, my sighting rules would have said if I was a hex further back, I would not be able to see that because I'm behind the crest. Uh, but that is not how this system is designed to work. Basically, this system is like, yeah, you know, if you've got a couple, a couple hexes worth of your terrain, your level of terrain, you are not going to be able to see beyond that. <laughs> You're just not going to be able to see beyond that, is what it really kind of works out to. Um, but whatever. Uh, in this case, yeah, you know, if you, if you define the crest lines or whatever, it makes more sense. I understand the desire not to have crest lines on the map and not to just, or not to operate the line of sight based on crest lines because yes, they are not always the case, but they're more often the case than just the, yeah, if you trace more than a couple of hexes over your own, own terrain, you're screwed, <laughs> your own height. Anyway, uh, I think I'm gonna read for a while. Just uh, not really, I, it's too hard to play too much of this and I don't think I should just keep watching news shows and stuff. That is not the best for my health. It's, uh, it's Halloween, right? Um, and yesterday I tried to convince myself to go out and see what I can see. I'm trying to do it again today. I want to get some of Raid in, which starts in about an hour. And then maybe, uh, I don't know. <laughs> Yesterday when I tried to convince myself it rained soon after and it's supposed to rain again tonight. Um, but that's not necessarily terrible. Um, just feel like I should get out and walk or something. I don't know. But the thing is, it's best when it's kind of dark because people have their decorations lit up and stuff and it would be spookier. I don't know why uh, this kind of thing appeals to me, but I just feel like I should do something. And there's at least a street or two that I haven't gone. It's funny, uh, when I first moved in here, I was really worried we would have trick-or-treaters. Uh, there don't seem to be any kids in my neighborhood at all. <laughs> And no one would come here to trick or treat. It's not, you know, like a dense subdivision or anything. There's a fair amount of houses, but it's there are many, many better places to be. I just find it kind of amusing. Uh, like I, where I lived before was in condos, and nobody would come. And I seem to have chosen wisely again to avoid that kind of irritation. All right, we're on the reciprocal gunfire infantry. French are going to get first shot. What do they want to do? We've got a supreme advantage over here, so we probably don't really want to shoot there. <laughs> over here, we're not all that interested here either. Where we're really interested is in the center. We can't start in the center though, <laughs> and can't get the race. I think. We're going to start on this end. I don't know if the allies are going to mirror image that and go over to their left flank or if they think they can outrace me. See, they have less units, so they would win the race if they do that. Hmm. Maybe that means I want to go over here. I got too many units that I, I need to fire at that, at that one damn skirmisher. So yeah, I think both sides will be starting over there. I want to catch the situation as I move partway through. Not a lot of, not a lot of hits happened. Of course not. Uh, <laughs> around here. Um, 
but uh, the French who started first have been lapped or have been uh, beaten out by the Allied forces. That would have happened in either direction. There just were far more French fire on both of the wings, which is kind of an interesting situation if one side has a concentration of fire on a wing, on the wings, they will lose the race to the center, unless, of course, they choose not to make certain fires. Of course, though, Allied fire is done. Now, one very valuable thing, I knocked out a gun there, or the gun crew, which, you know, I can throw a skirmisher up there to man the gun. So far, no gun has been remanned yet. <laughs> or I could uh, bring a gun crew from somewhere else if somehow a uh, gun runs out of ammo or something like that. I can run the crew around <laughs> and try to get it there. Uh, but yeah, right now that thing's been silenced and that's a big deal. You know, that one little skirmisher has significantly altered uh, the French firepower in that, that region. Granted, it's not much. It's, you know, one division up there. All right. Division. It's a brigade. <laughs> it's a full brigade, though, not a dummy brigade or whatever. Uh, that is what part of the first division, first corps? No, no, that's a division. That's a division up there. I get myself confused so easily. On the other hand, maybe as useful as a divisional artillery component. That skirmisher is gone. <laughs> it took a whole lot of fire, but he's gone and. Uh, before I walk away, as we go to the Allied Command phase, uh, let's take a look at what the numbers look like right now. 273 to 238. Still, you know, ranging around, around 35 point difference. It's been hitting around between 30 and 40, somewhere, somewhere in there. Whew! Doesn't feel like things are moving quickly enough for the French, though. Damn, damn Prussians. Damn Prussians. And it sure doesn't feel like a close-run thing. Although, it also doesn't feel like, uh, you know, it doesn't feel like the French are ready to break either. <laughs> it just, it feels like it's a muddled fight that, you know, we're, we're, we're getting, there's, there's an attritional nature to the, the combat here, which is usual for firepower games, I think. Um, however, it feels worse so, because it's basically a bunch of one point units rolling for a six or rolling for a five or a six against each other, because the skirmishers are the only damn things that seem to really count. Probably forget because only the skirmishers are affected by ammo depletion, I probably forget uh, ammo depletion more often than I remember. <laughs> Not that it has a hell of a lot of effect because the firepower happens only, you know, once a turn and everything looks like it has a fair chance of recovering its morale, the only, or recovering its ammo. Um, there are some iffies, like this guy would be in real trouble if he got to hit something. Uh, <laughs> those guys are just in trouble. I don't know. I don't know what's going to happen. You know, they're, they're going to try to retreat, I guess. <laughs> I don't know if they were legitimate. Like, would they have had to retreat through here or something? That would have generated all kind of fires, routings, all kind of crap. I figured that they could retreat around the enemy. The rules are a little, uh, Less than specific about that, uh, but I, I mean, these were guys who were like down here or something. <laughs> you know, they had gotten cut off from the rest of the unit. Actually, they might have been here. They could not retreat through the Hougoumont itself. They could retreat over this wall somehow or another, <laughs> but like. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, again, and they're they're not they're not prohibitive enough sounding to make me not do this kind of retreat, which actually feels pretty reasonable. Downstairs for like five minutes, <laughs> just came back up. <laughs> uh, 
uh, I checked Facebook and, you know, loaded a new pipe and I'm just like, I don't want to lay down and read. All right, so Allied Command and, uh, and Rally. Mainly for the command, there's a few units that I think Wellington wants to commit. Again, we're fighting in front of the in front of the ridge line, but it it feels right to me somehow. I don't know. I decided to commit three units over here, uh, two infantry, push the French back, and um, a cav unit to help protect against whatever the hell they're up to. It's all I can reach with uh, Wellington right now, and then I could move Uxbridge over that way to command this last cav unit if need be and get Wellington back across in closer so I can bring up uh, reserves here. I also brought the 8-5-R in to help here. I, I just, I, I'm someone who doesn't believe in like leaving exposed little things. So like the Hugomont, the La Hesson, these were locations that I felt were just too weak, you know, that I needed to strengthen them and throw reinforcements around them. Uh, my mindset does not allow me to play this out historically at all. Now we're going to do the rally, and notably, the command phase has passed, so these calves can't charge. But, you know, <laughs> they will next turn. <laughs> and they're also at least available for counter charge or opportunity charges or whatever you want to call it. Now, the idea of doing the French movement and whatnot is well beyond me. I just, you know, came up, did a little thing, good. <laughs> now I go back. The one danger with letting these guys get, you know, whatever, whatever those guys are up to, they're going to be able to fire uh, at the artillery if nothing happens. So that's kind of scary. Um, maybe the French can do something with Cav. I don't know. <laughs> I really don't know. He still can't internalize the sequence of play. It just, it feels too weird to me. Uh, it's kind of interesting to look at it from the, the different sides. Uh, from here, I feel the Allies feel a lot less certain about their position than I feel about them when I go around to this side. When I come to this side, it just looks like, yeah, I mean, the French are doing okay, it feels, but I keep getting stymied by these skirmishers and stuff. And I look and I see the wings look really nasty, but the center is where the Allies are probably at their weakest, which is why all the French fire at the center is a big deal. Okay. That's kind of interesting. I, uh, I did manage to get out for a walk about an hour long. Didn't even get halfway through my cigar, which is weird. <laughs> I just couldn't keep it lit very well, whatever. Um, but uh, yeah, once I got down the hill and it got dark enough, uh, there was a fair amount of uh, trick-or-treat activity. I knew, always knew that there, there were a lot of uh, decorated houses down there. I, I don't know when the last time I went out to wander around on Halloween, you know, during trick-or-treating time has been. Uh, certainly not since I, I've lived here. Yeah, I'm trying to remember. I don't even think in Phoenix. So we're probably talking like... I don't know, probably all the way back in Buffalo or whatever. Anyway, it was awfully neat <laughs> to see. Uh, so here we are, uh, French, French movement time. Okay, not what I expected, but fine. All right, getting out of squares, which we're gonna have to return to very shortly. Um, hoping to trade some shots or, or whatever and get some advantage out of it, I don't know. Pulled some of the artillery out to put it into uh, places where they can hit real units that I might have an impact on, but this one's still there. Kellerman's coming with the extra cav into play here. This is my cav here. 
Still trying to pick off this last skirmisher. <laughs> Don't want to give it any shots. I'm surrounding it, you know, whatever. Uh, but I did bring some additional skirmishers around here, some to protect uh, the way, the covered way here. If these guys start hitting me, they are probably going to be ammo depleted, which means they're going to be in a lot of trouble. And <laughs> I, on the other hand, am not going to be in a hell of a lot of trouble, I think. It's hard to tell. I don't... This guy doesn't have anybody. One, two, three, four, five. I think this is a real unit here. So I can actually trace to there and get supplies. Um, uh, forming up this line a little bit better. I'm trying to punch my way through here. Whatever, I got enough artillery there to keep those units disordered and in trouble. Meanwhile, continuing my pressure here. Expanding things so that I'm hitting, uh, what the hell are those? Those are Dutch. <laughs> Green is Dutch. And then f uh, a division of 1st Corps and of 6th Corps are pulling into place to take up the gap. Just to make sure I don't get my uh, flank rolled up by some exuberant allied charge. Uh, this cav moving around here doesn't really have anything to do. See, the problem is I'm not facing formed units outside of the terrain over here. But, well, you know, I paid the commitment cost. Don't know what this guy's up to. He's that cav unit. Yeah, I've got I've to think about uh, where I want Napoleon. Nay. Nay. Uh, these two Cav Corps are hard to move. One, two, three, four, five, six. Move them further. We'll put Nay there. I think I'm still outside of the eight. So that he can activate either of these if I desire. A, that is basically what your, your high-level commanders are for, is just putting something into motion, and from then on it can do whatever you like. Uh, I guess that means this guy, who's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, too far, too close, one, two, three, four, five, six, uh, head him over towards the fourth cab there, just so that I can bring whatever I like into play if I need to. That puts it on allied, uh, allied shock combat. And quite honestly, I don't think I see any. There's some possibility here with the Dutch. Let's see if they want to do any. If they do not, I think that's the, uh, the end of turn. So, where are we? We're here. We got a pretty decent unit in line that could hit a not quite as decent um, French unit. Is that worth my effort? <laughs> or do I just count on the strength of my defenses? This gun's gonna be able to play because these guys will not block. They're half a height hi uh, higher than the terrain. Which is fine. Um, just looking down the line, I, I, I really don't think I want to make this shot here. I'm probably yeah, should just turn it into fucking skirmishers. Um, although Dutch skirmishers, if I remember the option are not as good. I mean, if I remember to use the option, they're not as good as the, the French ones and the Brits. So this guy has a morale of one. Chances are I will probably get hit there because eh, only one third chance I get hit going in. How big was I? How big are they? I think I'm at five. This is at four, apparently. Which means I would be at 100% whether I get hit or not. 
I would be a plus two, plus three. It would put me out of position without a shot. But there are shots I could take with other units if I clear the way. Why don't we go in? All right. Uh, why don't I go in? This guy's flanking, so he doesn't get a shot at me. Only this guy gets a shot. He was a four-point line, moderate level against me. Oh, he's not good. I don't want to go into him. He almost certainly hits me. So, yeah, I wasn't, I wasn't counting correctly, or I wasn't looking at the right uh, column. So if I go in there, I'm definitely going to be taking a hit. Might end up taking a morale hit off that, which would make things much worse. Screw it. It's not worth it. Uh, I, my intuition there is I should not have shocked anyway. And that means we're going to be going to another game turn here. Get some dice up there. It's like 130. We got a... Scenario 2 starts there. I don't know what Scenario 2 is. Take a peek. Scenario 2 is La Hasson. We are actually relatively deeply hitting that already. So, for good or ill, uh, I feel like we're getting more of the battle underway than you would see historically, which I think is a good thing. Also, from the French point of view, from the French point of view in both cases. From the French point of view, it's also a good thing that the Allies have come down off the hills, that I'm hitting them more, that the fact that I brought so many troops in is reducing both sides' morale, right? Because I need this battle over before the Prussians get here, so I want a more complete engagement than uh, Napoleon seems to have had, and I... I Seem to be accomplishing that. I don't know how much. Uh, and Napoleon's still back here, ready to pull the guard into play. Why don't I push him back a couple more hexes, just so he could get more of it in if he wants to. Obviously, I never want to commit the guard, but in this game, I don't know. I, it's a bad thing if guard units falter. That, that much I know. Yeah. And their capability of doing anything at the Hugomont is just about nil. So, what would I want them for? I can save them for the Prussians, maybe. I don't know. Yeah, after a couple of hours of trying to get a nap in, I'm dead tired, but it's not happening. And I've got another couple hours to go before I can play Raid. But... Let's get a little bit of this in, I guess. French uh, command and rally phases here. Uh, I don't know if there is... I don't know if I want to activate any French units right now. Although, I have Ney down here to grab these Cav if I want them, but... They're probably heading that way, and... I probably don't actually want to send them that way. <laughs> and likewise, I've got Napoleon down here with the guard. I don't really want to bring the guard in. Uh, my own cav is not ready to charge yet. It's still recycling. So it's rally time, I guess. Well, as I started moving the Allied forces, I got some of the Dutch moving over here, then decided to switch to this side. I found the leader that I couldn't find. Apparently I've activated him now. Uh, I don't think it's a big deal that I had a different unit commanded, but <laughs> whatever. And after completing the Allied movement, and uh, oddly, stupidly, whatever, screening my cav with these Dutch, which is problematic because there's French cav facing me that could create a charge zone, but I'll get, uh... By the time that comes around, 
it'll be this time in the turn again and I'll be able to throw myself into square for what that's worth. Um, it just, I would like to have my calves supporting me here. Um, I'm kind of afraid to try to turn the flank while there's these unallocated calf. I, it would be really hard as the allied player to figure out, oh, wow, when could the French get those into play again, you know, against me? If I get too close to them, they're, they're going to trigger. But I saw a couple of places where, hey, maybe it would make sense to, you know, melee attack. First of all, here, yeah, again, the odds, a column looking at a skirmisher, a single skirmisher, I'm like, yeah, I don't dare. Sure, I'm in the open and everything. Everything should be fine. Skirmishers are too dangerous. I, I just can't afford to attack them. Uh, he gets a hit on me. There's a 50-50 chance he disorders me. He, he's pretty much guaranteed. Uh, well, not guaranteed, is he? Uh, but that skirmisher has a two-thirds chance of hitting me. If it hits me, it has a 50-50 chance of disordering me. If it disorders me, it's going to result in a DR, which will rout me <laughs> and cause me two more losses. So I'll take three losses off a single hit uh, as the most likely result. Again, line infantry cannot face a single skirmisher in the open. Likewise, up here, I had this kind of thought before. Did I want to assault uh, with the Dutch units? Well, for the same reasons, I don't want to assault. Well, for maybe even more reasons, I don't want to assault with the French. Again, fire would happen first. I'd probably end up disordered by that fire and just could not launch the attacks. Now, I'm in line here, so that's, that's an issue. Could skirmishers assault something? Well, they can't assault formed infantry, so that's not really an issue, like shock attacking. Um, there's possibilities through here, but again, the odds are against me because of the terrain. So I don't even want to fuck around with it. So yeah, basically, shock combat is taken off the table by the existence By just about everything, really. I mean, I was going to say by the existence of the skirmishers, but honestly, any regular form troops are pretty much too dangerous to shock attack unless you've got a flank or something. It does not feel like Napoleonic combat here in, in this part of the game. The fire combat, fine. Whatever shock is supposed to represent, it's something that obviously is impossible to happen. The only exception to that is these skirmishers are sneaking up on this gun, um, they're going to get a shot at it and probably wipe it out that way. But if they don't wipe it out, well, maybe wipe it out that way. It's not a high chance. Uh, but if they don't wipe it out that way, they can they can melee it. So, uh, but we're going to pause for the fire combat. I need tea. Probably end up trying to snooze again or do something else. This is just hurting my back. Good morning, all Saints Day, and uh, I guess it's time to do some shooting. Um, don't know how far I'm going to get today because it's dancing day. I have to get back to sleep at some point. Uh, but we're on the artillery fire. Let's see who gets first shot. Let's see, I don't know. I mean, it's going to be the French with the first shot. I don't know. So that gun's been knocked out for now. Looking to see where I have artillery. I have artillery lined up here and here. And I don't really see anywhere where I have artillery versus art I have it over here. So that's where I want to start. That's the only place where I'm in any competition at all. All right, uh, artillery fire done. I'm out of tea, so I got a break, but um, <laughs> that's fine. It'll just be a short one. At first, it felt pretty limited. Uh, basically, I was looking at artillery firing a lot of times at skirmishers 
which just wasn't doing shit. Um, but as we got further down the line, uh, we started to clear. I don't even know if I remember to fire this guy. He's got a pretty good shot, actually. Uh, I think I missed him. Probably because he looks kind of cavy, even though these guys also do. Uh, it's the one symbol, like most of the symbols in the game are really, really clear. The horse artillery, it looks so much like the cav that I just don't catch it. Especially, I don't know, it's just certain angles and whatnot, the dot just disappears and it just looks like a stripe to me. For example, this unit, the, uh, the numbering, when I'm at a distance, and I'm wearing my good glasses, when I'm at a distance, the numbering's there cutting between where, and I, see the problem is, it's hard to, to see the unit at all, but the numbering kind of cuts across right between where the dot and the top of the line are, and it just makes it look like it's a continuous line to me. I, if I'm paying attention, I don't see that, but it means some, some guns don't fire when they probably should. <coughs> but anyway, a lot of the fire was at skirmishers, which sounds stupid as hell, and it probably is, but within the game, it's one of the few things that can handle skirmishers, so it's like, yeah, okay, I'll do that. Uh, we are seeing ammo depletions showing up, uh, at least one. And for the first time ever, we had some counter battery fire against that unit, which ended up, uh, because it's distant enough, ended up hitting a gun, which is really kind of useless. Like, I've dropped the gun from a 6 to a 5. Okay, at minimum range, it's a column shift. It's, it's actually a column shift pretty much at any range. So, so it is of some worth. Uh, but it's not worth any victory points at all. The whole battery has to go to be worth 3. Which kind of doesn't matter the size of the battery. Like, uh, there's some really tiny batteries out there. I know there are fours. I'm wondering if there's anything smaller than that. I know there's cab that's twos. But anyway, the battery ends up... Why is there a one on these guys? I guess the amount of men. But it, it's a useless piece of information. Each one has one. Uh, anyway, uh, the, amount, the amount of... Uh, It's much, much less than what you get when you hit a gun any other way, like range four or less through any means, uh, which ends up killing the gun crew and pretty much knocking the gun out. Yeah, it can become a disordered gun if you want to commit a skirmisher to it. A disordered cannon is no better than the skirmisher itself. If you look at the chart... <laughs> It's firing the same as that single skirmisher is. I, there might be some advantage in terms of you get to fire it a little early, but really what you want to do is you want to um, uh, deplete your ammo on a gun and get that, get that gun out of the way so it doesn't get captured or whatever, and then send that crew off to one of the guns that isn't crewed. All right, I'm gonna go get T. I expect to be back relatively soon to do the infantry fire, but maybe not, you know, right away. Because there's a few things that I think Nave versus Wellington got a little bit better than this system. One of them became clear. One of them is the command. The command and control in this is just so clunky to use, and I'm really not convinced that, like, it should be quite as difficult as it is here. And obviously, in Nave versus Wellington, there's no command and control. But the other thing is, because there's no command and control in Nave versus Wellington, they had to justify the range values on the leaders. And those range values are the range at which they give a morale bonus. And also a combat bonus, I believe. But <laughs> that's a big deal. Like, that morale bonus the morales on the units is just too low 
And in fact, I, I would argue that these units just don't have quite enough staying power. Um, they're way too likely to start dissolving, especially because of the way the fire uh, operations work, where you can uh, concentrate fire against a unit and basically drop it from good order to routed with a couple of hits. Okay, first shot, I think I'm gonna start over on this side because things are a little bit less dense. I have a whole bunch of firepower that's not going to mean much over here. Again, the center is probably the most important, but I want to get all my shots in, right? And if I do that, that almost assures that the allies want to fire from that side first. I'm a little tired of all the walking around. It's quite a bit. Uh, and so I've, uh, I've decided now that the two lines have crossed each other, I'm just going to continue on with one and then go to the other one. There's no real reason to be walk, to be alternating anymore. And again, may have uh, hit myself with some ammo depletion, or missed some ammo depletions. I did get a few though. Here, here, here. Uh, I don't know if I got hits with skirmishers before that. In general, if skirmishers are hitting, they're probably ammo depleted. Like quite often they're making shots that they only have a one in six chance uh, to do. That's gonna put me down on the Allied command phase. I don't know, I don't know if I'm gonna make it there today. Like, I don't know if I'm gonna make it through the turn today, um, is I guess the thing. Point totals though is uh, kind of the important thing. And we're at 220, 260, still that 40 point range. Oh, feels to me like the French need to up the amounts, uh, we've taken maybe a hundred off of each side, and we've gone eight turns, and it's six till when the uh, Prussians start showing up. Now, the Prussians don't all come in at once, if I recall correctly, so, you know, we're going to get a... A bit of, uh, there may be some leeway if, if those numbers get close enough. And they also don't just, fl they don't flood the Allied Army with points. The Allied Army has separate points. I actually thought the different components of the Allied Army had, had their own points. I don't know if that would make sense. Uh, like tracking, say, on a core level or whatever, uh, in order to like just say that cores out. I don't think so. I, I, I think by army does make sense. Um, so, yeah. But uh, a lot of routed units we can see. Got a bunch running back from here. The attack uh, in that area pretty much collapsed. On the other hand, this area here, the Brits have been emptied out of and it's not like I have a lot up on that ridge line so bad shit could happen there here it's fairly even here I'd say it's fairly even mainly because it's skirmishers fighting skirmishers actually the the allies have a fair amount of formed troops there over here we chased away one of the Dutch again chasing the real units doesn't do much uh, the only thing you get out of it is eventually you might be able to knock a, cut off a, a, a skirmishers and get them ammo depleted and then they're no longer really in play. You can just kind of pick them off. But it'll take time, right? And a number of shots. So like, it took me a while to clear this out. Uh, yeah, there probably should be a French ammo depletion somewhere down there. I think it would be on this one because I just cleared him out. Um, but I think I did it on the first shot. Again, not a big deal. There's a formed unit nearby. It's going to recover. That that unit actually just doesn't matter because he's not going to move into, into a position before he gets his... I don't remember where it is. I think it's facing formation. So like... Before you get your march, you, they're going to they're gonna recover them, but I have to look it up every time uh, when I'm worried about it. 
But yeah, I'm not really sure that the you know it feels to me like neither army can really break. Again, no. I'm on a pace where I'd be maybe breaking the Allied army somewhere down here. Well, that changes significantly if I get the 25 points. And La Hassan looks like it's falling. Hugomont feels damn near unassailable as long as you can keep supplies on it. And even if you can't, it's still going to take so damn long to get rid of all those skirmishers that even if they end up out of ammo, like if I cut the road here, which is quite possible, uh, you know, if I, if I get them cut off, but they may want to abandon it in that case. It's 15 points. I don't know. <laughs> I really don't know. Like, that's a lot of points. All right. I was making myself something to eat, and, which I don't need, but <laughs> it gives justification to the breaks, right? Uh, but uh, I started thinking, you know, this system is just too cumbersome for this big a battle, right? Um, to some extent, I have to argue that uh, any regimental scale, and I think this actually, I don't know, <laughs> uh, any, any regimental scale game is just too painful for, uh, for this size battle. It's why I tend to favor the CWB and BS series, even over uh, the very clever uh, line of battle that Last Chance for Victory was. It's just, uh, I don't know, when you're looking at a really big battle, it feels like, yeah, that's about the right size, brigades, whatever. You might argue that some of the smaller battles really need to jump down to the regimental level, and I'm okay with that. But beyond that, the system itself is very cumbersome. And I tried to think about, if you wanted to play it by the rules as written, even if you went to a multiplayer situation to try to reduce some of the burden, right? Quite often I'd play like TSS, well, not quite often, but a couple of times I played TSS uh, multiplayer. I've played a couple of uh, mainly minis games that are bigger in, in a lot of players. And yeah, it, it reduces the effort that any given player has to make quite a bit. One thing that I found, though, is generally you don't break it up into, like, sectors and a couple of people are just in charge of handling their sector and they just play out their full turn without, like, too much regard for what else is going on. And then, you know, everything can handle simultaneously. So what you're really just doing is giving people a chance to kind of lean back and break <laughs> while, while other people take their turns. Usually, I guess you could conceivably have everybody playing at the same time in some games. This one would be really tough. With the rules as written, you couldn't do it because the way the reciprocal fire phases, they're the real time eaters. Uh, the way those work is you're supposed to start at one end of the line and go down to the other. But I guess you could break it into sectors again and say, you know, look, there's no fire going on here. Somebody handle this while somebody handle, while, while whatever players there are handle all the rest of it in line or whatever. Even conceivably, you could just, you know, draw an imaginary line on the map that goes through some of the firing. It's a gamey design piece, right? Why let it yeah, why let it influence too much? And you might get the same kind of local advantages as you can get globally by uh, by fiddling around with it. So I, I could see you fiddling around with the rules in, the, in that sort of way. But this battle does not really break nicely into divisional into divisions of the board. 
you know, honestly, I mean, I guess you could put a division here more or less and say, look, you know, this is kind of interested in the Hugo. Something over here is interested in this. Something over here is interested over there. Um, also, in terms of player responsibilities, feels almost natural to give people a command that they have for the, the course of the game. But one of the big command, you know, one of the big options is the Prussians. Well, that player has got nothing to do for quite a long time. It can be useful or you can like have somebody, you know, play, say, the extreme left wing and the Prussians uh, or something along that line. And maybe he gives up some, some responsibility as time goes on, if it gets too complicated to handle both. But I don't know, it just, it, it doesn't really lend itself. And, and the big thought that I, I was having is just that across the board, man, these really, really like big battles, I'm a lot happier seeing them on the, on the battalion level. And uh, uh, on the brigade level, sorry, yeah, yeah, let's go there. Um, especially since what I generally tend to want to do is not just fight out the charge at Waterloo, right? Waterloo itself isn't that interesting a battle. I know, I know. Everybody makes a Waterloo game, but the reality is to get enough room to be able to do interesting things, you need to, like, cover all four battles that happened in, in, in this period. So, uh, yeah, so something like uh, Le Retour or, or, or something along that line is much more appealing for a monster because you've got, like, same amount of counters, same amount of board and whatnot, well, maybe more, but you're, you're giving yourself room for that maneuvering and, and, and capability to, like, actually have some serious uh, decisions to make. Uh, you could argue I'm making serious decisions here, but it really doesn't feel like it. The only decision that I made that I feel was really serious is, is how much do I commit the French and the English coming down off the hills? And I just couldn't help myself with the latter. <laughs> you know, I just couldn't help myself. And I'm beginning to think that they didn't want to. They have to maintain some kind of link, though, to the Hugues and La Hesson, if they want to hold them. <clears throat> it didn't have to be as big as I've made it. Well, sleep turned into a little more than a uh, brief nap while a video played. <laughs> uh, I don't know if I'll try again. Anyway, means I have a shot at getting this out of the way. I failed to place this where I want it. It should be the Allied Command phase. We probably bumped it with the camera. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, yeah, then after that it'll be French movement. Uh, the, the sequence of play. I just got in another trying to point out what's wrong, and I, I don't know. Somebody's trying to point out how the LOS works, and it's like, I kind of get how it works. I don't like the implications of it, uh, and that it's too cumbersome for a half-baked LOS system, like for one that doesn't actually do particularly well. Um, and it does significantly, it, it, it's definitely incorrect for for the kind of the kind of terrain that I see as being here, which is not very steep in any locations. Um, but anyway, uh, what are we at here? Uh, yeah, anyway, the the LOS system is cumbersome the same way that the sequence of play is cumbersome. But the sequence of play works remarkably well. The LOS does not. It rem works. I think significantly worse than the CWB system, which is why that's what I'm using more or less. As a quick test of that, what's going on over here? I got some cav here that's trying to sight this unit so that I can conceivably make a charge attack. And I think it declines below me. Uh, so this 
there's kind of like hill here essentially so I'm not going to be able to spot these I'm not going to be able to launch an attack could I use this commander to launch the attack I don't remember uh, but I also don't feel all that inclined do I like a charge here doesn't really help me my cav is more to protect my infantry than it is to actually launch an attack now although the attack could uh, could hit the infantry uh, I'm sorry the attack could protect the infantry by driving the enemy cav away but I would get close and I would activate these and problems would happen and that's something I don't want to have happen um, new units. Do I have any? I don't know. Get a little punch drunk when I take a nap. <laughs> I can't find a leader for this unit. I think these were involuntarily added to NE1. How about that? There they are. And is one NE1 there too? Yeah. So, I don't know when that happened. But that's going to be two more units that should have been added to the uh, situation. And I have a couple allied routers slipping away. It's so hard because it's like, oh god, you know, when do I next get to move? Like, I could have moved back here where some of these, were these last turn routers? Uh, maybe. Or maybe they just got ignored and got let through. And, you know, now I have to realize, okay, well, I'm moving into the French movement phase, so let's hunt the routers down. When I fuck up with one side, I remember with the other how to fix it, you know? And if I see routed units, I better step on top of them now. But the weird thing is, the units that just, you know, triggered the indication of the problem, that happens a full turn, you know, a full player turn away from when... I have to deal with it. So, yeah. Uh, which brings us to, I guess, French facing in formation. I can't find anything to do with CAV, so we just recovered what we can. We got disrupted units up here, but these guys have guns in their, you know, they're in minimum range on, on the guns, so they're not going to fix themselves. Kind of a big event here. Well, has been taken. I moved uh, a unit. I'm trying to find units I can move. It's actually really hard because the commanders are going back to rally units. They can't actually move them. This one was in range at the time. Then I got these ammo depleted guys. I don't want to bring them into into the line. They'll just cause problems. They're not able to fire or whatever, even though they could absorb fire. Uh, but by taking this, we had a 20 point swing over here. <laughs> Still doesn't seem that impressive, but uh, yeah. And again, I don't think the Huomo can fall in, in time. I just don't think it can. So making some headway against at least these uh, parts of the Dutch out here. What is this called? Peplo. Mm. <coughs> these calves still lost, wandering around, looking for something to do. <laughs> Unlike over here where the Allied army came down or came forward, there's really nothing to interdict here, but I need them to support my line, presumably, because otherwise these cavalry will cause a problem, but I can't just cut through this shit, so I'm swinging around. And remember, these streams are impassable, so i got to find a bridge to go across. <laughs> uh... More of First Corps coming up into place here, Fourth Corps as well, or sorry, Sixth Corps as well moving into place here. Uh, this is First Corps here. Actually, this is all Sixth. This is First. Uh, moving up to fill in the gaps that some of the routes took, uh, took their pay on. This is, I think, First Corps stuff here that's making uh, the advances here. So... I've got them kind of broken up, but it's because 6th came in as a reserve and is filling in the gap more than anything else. 
Uh, covered all my routers, I think. <laughs> Which means we're on time for Allied Shock. Now, Shock is really, really ineffective. Yeah, so far in this game. Mainly because if you're close enough to shock, you're close enough to get shot at with a heavy shot, which means you're close enough to get disordered. Uh, morale checks are really hard to make. <laughs> and it's really questionable. So for example, I could look at places where shock doesn't look bad, like up here. It wouldn't be a terrible shock, but it would also disrupt my line, and that's a pretty good line up there. I don't really want to disrupt it. I'll just trade fire with that disorganized unit, and that's perfectly good. Uh, don't want to do it here. We get all the shit shot out of us. Uh, this might be worth it, but again, I got firepower advantages. It's just, it's not worth shocking. Um, it's more appealing for the French to shock because they're trying to get things over with, like they're trying to get those numbers low, but it's so ineffective that I don't want to do it. Now we've got a couple interesting places, like I'm coming in on these guns and this little remnant of a line here, that's going to get busted up obviously. This is going to go and you can see this whole sector the Allies have a real problem um, directly to the left for them of Hugmol. Uh, that is really their only problem right now. And I don't know what that's going to result in, but you know, if I come up behind these units, that's terrible. And getting units out of, out of a combat situation is horrible too. It's just really, really rough. Oh, look, I got a leader right up there. Like, he can be shot, but it's not very effective. Like, it's a very, at the best, it's a one in six chance of, of getting a reduction on him. And I think it's actually like a third of that. The, the way I'm doing it, it is. But it's not, it's not clear how you're supposed to handle that. Um, but yeah, I think... Uh, I think the Allies have to do something which they have not done. They should have been activating some of the units here. Uh, but it's so hard to see the full picture. And now, now that the French line moved forward, I'm like, ooh, I was in a lot of trouble there. Oops. Well, I guess it's going to be a, another full turn before I can start to do anything about that, right? Because I had to make the decision here to allocate units. But they don't march until later. So like, yeah. all it really means is there's going to be another French, you know, French march or whatever after whatever gets cleared out of there. But it is, uh, it is some of the, it's hard to internalize how this system actually works in so many ways because the sequence is so odd. And I find it a, more difficult here than in Ney versus Wellington because it's so easy to get tied up in the little problems in any particular sector or whatever. It's hard to see the big picture when you're making those command decisions. You're looking down the line and you're like, oh, everybody who's there is in command and yeah, I assume I'm doing fine. Well, I'm not doing fine here. I came off the hill like a fucking idiot and <laughs> it's not working at all well. That, if anything, that, that is the biggest, uh, the biggest error that I've made on either side, I think. On the other hand, I have things, you know, like the French. Will I remember? I probably want to get the rest of First Corps into play. Because things look a little weak through here. And I think I have a chance of like doing some real damage to their position there. But it might make more sense to push this way and extend any kind of breakthrough I can make on that ridge. I don't know if there's room for the troops. It looks pretty crowded right now. All right. Uh, I wasn't going to stop here for uh, 
I wasn't going to load the video up here, but I think I'm going to. It feels, it doesn't feel like a particularly good time. Like I, I would prefer to have done it after the next turn. I've only done a couple of turns, but uh, given that I'm going to be probably not uh, playing again until Sunday, <laughs> it seems like a good idea to, to load it up a little in advance. Alrighty.